Okay, yeah, so we'll get started. I want to introduce everybody first, okay? Um, okay. So, yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, we have Rachel here. Um, she's Rachel, the YouTuber, YouTuber on Instagram. We have Dr. Sony, who, who is, uh, he goes by Dr. JD. He's from Arizona JD. College of Optometry, and um, he's a doctor now who practices in Bakersfield. Uh, Rachel actually goes to an optometry school at uh, Southern California College of Optometry. Um, mm -hmm. She's a first-year student. She just took her first midterm today, mm -hmm. and um, she's, she's been interning at my practice since she was 11 years old, and she's like wow. you know, over 20 now, but um, she, she's wanted to be a doctor for a long time. That's great. And, uh, so we wanted to include her today because she's actually helped at some events that we've hosted with Vince at my practice. Uh, Rachel's volunteered and helped out before events. So she has some pictures with you when we were at the office before too. Good job. So, so she knows you. <laughs> yeah. So, and then we obviously we have a uh, guest, uh, Vince Ferragamo, who took time out of his day to do this for us. Um, you know, he's a Super Bowl a 14 quarterback for the Rams. Um, he works for Fox Sports or Fox uh, NFL on Fox, I think, on Fox 11. Um, you'll see him on TV on Saturday, Saturdays and Sundays, a lot of times on the weekends during football season. And um, he also runs Touchdown Real Estate. And, um, and that's in Anaheim Hills. And he also has a cool winery at his house that uh, great wine. So um, yeah, that's Vince right here, one of our good friends. And um, so I'll, I have a, we'll start with a few questions for you, Vince, about the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question, I've been seeing Vince uh, as uh, for his eyes for about 10 years, I think. Um, and, you know, he, he wears contacts, glasses. But my question for Vince is during your football career, Vince, because I didn't know you back then, um, did you wear contacts on the field as a quarterback for the Rams? Well, you know, Alex, you you kind of know my eyes better than anybody else because yeah. you've looked into them enough. But yeah. uh, I really, you know, I think dating back to when I was in high school, um, I wore glasses. And then when I started to play football as a 10th grader, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I noticed that uh, I should probably wear contacts. And at that time, they were hard lenses. They weren't, they didn't have the soft lenses back in those days. So um, you know, I tried wearing the hard lenses, which was great for me because you had no obstruction with putting the helmet on. So you had the face mask and you had your helmet and the, your eyes were fine. So, but I do recall one time uh, at one of my games as a sophomore, I got one of them popped out in the San Pedro game and I was playing with one eye. Actually, I could only see with one eye, but I still threw a touchdown pass with one eye, just closed the other eye and just threw it. But um, yeah, that was that was the problem back in those days because you know any type of quick sudden movement with your eyes, you know, and then when you got imploded or you got hit, yeah. then you know the, I, the the lens might pop out. But with the new soft lenses that I wore through college football and through and through pros, I didn't have that problem. So, but yeah, I've been I've been wearing them for a long time, Alex, since uh, since high school, and that was back in the early seventies. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so another question about eyes and about, and this is an interesting one and about optometry school. Um, so I remember in 1999, when I first started at the college of optometry, one of our first slides for practice management was a slide about famous people who have gone to the optometry college in, in Fullerton and your name showed up. I still remember that yeah. from 1999 and uh, another student from, I think 2000, about five years ago, um, she showed me the slide. They still show that slide at every, every fall quarter. Uh, Vince Ferragamo went to our school. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? And, and uh, you know, cause obviously you did very well in real estate, obviously, but then your optometry school experience too. Well, that's a good, that's a good memory, yeah. Alex, because yeah. it goes back a, a long time, back in the 80s. Um, yeah. I actually, after, after the Super Bowl game, I was attending a medical school at Creighton University back in Omaha. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that for one year. And then in the second year, it just became to be too difficult to the transition going back and forth. So um, I tried to think of another field that I could study in the off seasons during the football season. And the third year we went to the Super Bowl. So that pretty much disappeared. But I did attend the Southern California College of Optometry. I was uh, admitted there and I attended one semester in the winter quarter, uh, which was a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I thought this might be something for a future when I'm done with football. But as things turned out, 
I did make a career in professional football, so I ended up playing 10 years, and uh, which was good for me. And then when I retired, of course, I got into the real estate and never got back to the to the medical field. So, but so thanks for remembering. But oh, yeah, I am, I am one of your, I didn't graduate, but I am one, I was a former student there, yes. <laughs> and what year was that, Vince, um, well, when you went there? That I think that was in 1980 or 1981, I believe. Oh, so it was uh, right after the Super Bowl then. Right, yeah, right during, either before or after the Super Bowl, yeah. So. That's really cool. <laughs> what made you play in the Super Bowl and then think, hey, I want to learn more about eyes? <laughs> I should have. <laughs> I, I think, you know, because uh, vision is such a major plays such a major role in, in for a quarterback to be able to see the field and uh, to be able to, to interpret what you see and then apply that to, you know, what, what your reaction and what, what you're going to do with the football. So, but uh, yeah, having good vision is, is a big part of it, Dr. JD. And so you, you really have to be prepared for that. And, but, you know, I think that that was always something that interested me because ever since I was a young kid, I had problem, with my vision. I, I couldn't see very good. I had to wear glasses. And it's a good thing I, I was checked at an early age because I would have maybe went through a lot of schooling with, with not very good vision. And so it might have hampered my, my academics. But yeah. as it turned out, we were lucky for contact lenses because contact lenses uh, are a great thing. But you see a lot of great NFL players that have played in the NFL with glasses. One of them that comes out to mind was one of my former teammates is a Hall of Famer, Eric Dickerson. He wore glasses. Right when there. Football. <laughs> there, you go. there he is. There he is right above me. And so, um, oh but yeah, but you know, Eric, Eric just was fine with the glasses. I mean, but he was he a super wears. athlete, just a, yeah. just a great running back. And he still wears glasses. He has a large collection of them still. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's so interesting because especially as a quarterback, right? When you're in the pocket, if you don't have central, good central vision or even good peripheral vision, if someone's coming at you from the sides and they're trying to sack you, I mean, you have like six, seven seconds max to, to get the ball to your hands, right? Probably a lot less than that, J.D. <laughs> you, you, get, you really, uh, the timing of the throw, if you have three to four seconds, that's a long time. Usually a lot of our stuff is done in a time rhythm kind of throw. So you get back in the pocket and you let the ball go because I think you run a big risk to stay in the pocket too long with the, with the talent that they have coming in and you know, you, you pay a lot of guys a lot of money to sack the quarterback. So uh, that's, uh, they're, they're driven to do that. And uh, they're, they're bearing in on you. So you got to get rid of it. But today's football is a little different than when I grew up because it, it's, it's not so much a pocket passer as, as much as it's a moving pocket now. And so it does afford the quarterback the ability to, to move around a little bit and uh, to, to make some runs to, you know, as we saw last year with the Ravens and, uh, they, they did such a great job w with that, but they, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a thing of the, the future, you know, but still vision is still a big part of it. You really have to be able to see and be able to interpret really quickly. Yeah. Right. Like um, nowadays, so many players, if they get concussions or they're injured, they do certain tests and we know sometimes um, vision can be lost or there can be visual issues. And um, like you were kind of hitting on the, the rule changes back in the day, um, there were so many more, you could be so much more physical, right? Nowadays, you, they really want to protect the quarterback. And um, have you heard any stories of anybody, maybe you or anybody else with any vision issues, maybe in the middle of the game after getting hit so hard or anything along those lines? Well, concussions it was always a, a big uh, dilemma for, for football because when, when I first started playing, you could hit legally someone in the helmet, helmet to helmet, or use your fist or use your hand. And uh, the use of the helmet and the head uh, has become uh, less magnified in, in the last few years because of the concussion problems. But we find out that in an early age, if kids are playing tackle football at, uh, say, an age of less than 12 years old, the, the chances of them developing problems down the road are, are far greater than if they decided not to play and then played later. So the impact that, that a younger child would have when he gets hit in the head seems to have more damage, you know, for future, for future players. So, um, but yes, if you do get hit in the head back in those days, not only would it distort your vision, but it would distort your, you would be knocked out pretty much a lot of times and uh, you'd be incoherent or you would, you would lose your balance. Um, uh, you, you might get upset, you, you know, you might have some, uh, 
uh, some memory loss, you know, but, but I think, you know, they've really resolved a lot more of that in recent years. Now it's not as, as a glaring of a problem because you cannot hit players and what use with the use of your, uh, of a, a lethal helmet. You have to really protect the quarterback in the pocket or protect running backs and protect wide receivers. I mean, they can't hit an unprotected wide receiver, you know, blindside. So um, I think those are good for the game and, and good for the sport. Good. good one. Rachel, do you have a question, Rachel? Yeah, sure. So football being such a team sport, how would you define the relationships you built during your football career? Well, that's a good question, Rachel, because I think, uh, you know, football is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So um, you're only as good as the people around you. And mm -hmm. uh, I had the great privilege of, of playing in a Super Bowl with, with a great team. And we not only had a great offense, we had a great offensive line, which the quarterback really loves to have uh, when you're back there and you're well protected. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, uh, you know, it's like having a padded pocketbook in the back. So you're, you're in good shape. But defensively where we're very strong the Rams have always been a very good defensive team over the years traditionally and so uh, but being as a team I think there's a lot more to be gained from team sport because when you win everyone wins and everyone is satisfied and it's it's even more um, I, I think it's 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 more fulfilling for a player when you have everybody can enjoy a victory and then when you lose I mean it's generally not one person's fault. I mean, great teams always don't ever put the blame on one person. They always use it as, well, we could have done better. You know, we could have been better. I could have been better at this, or we could have been better at that. So the great teams are, are, are teams that um, uh, have the contributory um, focus from everybody in the entire squad, that everybody has a job and everybody contributes to the final result. And when you do that, you get more than 100% benefit. You get 110%. So it really does uh, make a big difference. And it's more, it's more gratifying to, um, to help others too as well. And you, not only helping yourself, but you're helping others achieve greatness. And, but it's all done as a team, collectively as a team. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I also want to add to that, Vince. You also have, even after your playing career, you work with a lot of your uh, – former teammates and Rams players like Leroy and a few other people, right? At the real estate business. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, yeah, we still kind of focus, um, you know, our business around a team concept, you know, because yeah. in the real estate business, um, you know, it requires a lot of detailed work, a lot of research, a, a lot of partnership. And the closer you are to your clients, through your affiliations and through the other companies that support you as well. We have escrow. There's escrow is a big part of all transactions. There's the title company, there's, there's insurance, there's the lender. And so everybody needs to play, be part of the team to get to accomplish their goal, which is to close the sale of the home. Yeah. So it, it's very, it's, it's vital. And, um, you know, in our office, we work, we have great teamwork. No one's in it for themselves. If, if uh, we get, uh, some business comes our way, we all try to satisfy the client because the client's needs are at the foremost of, uh, of what we do. Obviously, you're in business to, you know, to make money as well and, be, and have a good business platform, but you're also in the business to helping people. And that's kind of where it all stems from, how people find their, their first home or, you know, maybe it's a second home or refinance, save them money every month. So it's, it's gratifying to be involved in the business we're in. Most definitely. No way. Yeah. That, that's so cool to see because um, if I had to give a, a parallel for our listeners, um, we're all in the optometry eye field. And um, I've seen some people in our field, for example, after you go to four years of school, you kind of get relaxed. And some people, they say, hey, I'm, I'm just going to practice. And that's kind of it. I'm just going to live my life. But for you, like you went through the Super Bowl, you played in the NFL, but it wasn't like a, hey, I'm just going to be content. It's like, I'm going to keep working hard. I'm going to, you know, start a company. I'm, I'm going to get into wine, maybe start a nonprofit. Like, what was your motivation to just keep pushing? Good question, J.D., because I, I, think, I, I think it's just the respect that as you as a kid growing up, you know, with, from my Italian parents and uh, my background, I was always taught to, um, you know, respect the other person, respect your parents. And then when you get respect your elders, 
you know, when you, when you have a Sunday meals at the home, everyone comes together, it's fun, you enjoy it. Uh, and then when you meet new people, you know, when you go to someone's house, you, you respect their home, you sit there and you don't make a mess, uh, you, you know. So I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of that it w stems from the fact that when I was a young kid, you know, I, I learned that at an early age. And so, um, you know, I think it's real important to, to be able to, to have that respect and to go on and do other things for other people. And so we started a foundation. We started the Vince Ferragamo Foundation where we help Special Olympics. Um, a guy came to me when I was playing football and his name was Ed Chevalier. He had a daughter who was a Down syndrome girl and they were involved in the Special Olympics. And he said, hey, do you mind helping the kids and we're gonna do a little event? And I said, sure, I'll help you, Ed. And uh, you know, one, one thing led to another that the, the tournament came a, a huge success uh, locally in Southern California. It was the biggest fundraiser for Orange County Special Olympics. Uh, for 30 years, we did that. We also supported other programs. Uh, my wife has done a lot of work with the breast cancer uh, with the Orange Coast Memorial down in, in Fountain Valley. And uh, they developed a wing of the, of the breast ward, the breast cancer ward, and named it after the thanks for the Fins Ferragamo Foundation. And she did a lot of work to help them over the years. And so, you know, it's almost like giving back, you know? And so, I mean, you, you have to, you, you have to live and you have to do some kind of work, but you know, I, I just think that, you know, what propelled me was maybe sports and the team concept as Rachel asked me and, you know, just being involved in the community. And then once that happened, you know, I think um, more people could relate to that and, just, you know, shed, shed a good light on the world. And I think we need to see more of that in today's, you know, today's times, because a lot of people are looking at a lot of different things the wrong way. So I think it's, you know, we're all in this together. So we all have to support one another. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's amazing that you do that and that, that your motivation is to help others. I, I think even Dr. Corbin, um, you, you do often help other people with vision screenings, things along those lines, right? Yeah. We all do. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's Rachel does too. Yeah. <laughs> a motivation yeah. for you, right? And I think other people in our field, if we can apply that concept from you to, to our field. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Well, I've known Alex. I've known Alex. He's done a lot of great things for a lot of people. And, um, you know, it's not really what you can do for me, but more of what I can do for you. Mm -hmm. And I think Alex has yeah, it in yeah. his heart. And so that's how, why we're friends. <laughs> Because I think, uh, you know, we were attracted <laughs> to one another that way. And, um, and I think he's using his, uh, his knowledge and his professional career to help others, you know, by helping them see better. And, you know, I mean, give them the right information and, and give them the right correction. Um, so, I mean, I think, yeah, it just, it really stems for, first of all, you want to help people. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can also make a living doing the same thing. But it feels good to make people a better better as a person, too. It's not just their vision. But it's also helping kids in the community. Because Vince and I have done, uh, uh, you know, going to schools, talking to kids, reading to kids. Um, those are things that make an impact for the rest of their lives with these kids. And they'll never forget it. It may, it may inspire them to be a football player, an eye doctor, or, you know, something else. Um, so we, we want to make the world a better place. Not just see better, but, you know, enhance everything else in their lives, too. So, yeah, we, we work well together many years now. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> we're we're prime examples of uh, him helping us out, right, Rachel? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be here. So uh -huh. well, Rachel, Rachel was one of the kids that was, you know, she was our patient since she was seven years old. Um, and, you know, she worked her way up. At eleven years old, she decides she wants to be eye doctor. And look at her now. I mean, you know, what ten years later, eleven years later. I mean, she's taking midterms at the optometry school Vince went to, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do it without people like you and well, Dr. Liu being able to yeah. help us and bring us up right. in the profession. Definitely. Well, that's great of you, Rachel, because I, I've had three daughters of my own. And uh, my it's oldest awesome. daughter um, always had a dream to be a doctor, even when she was a young kid like you. Mm -hmm. She always wore her, uh, her grubs and, you know, she would wear her suit and have a stethoscope around her, uh, around her neck and mm -hmm. 
So she grew up with that, and that was her aspirations. Uh, obviously, she did get married later, but she ended up going to Vanderbilt and then went to medical school. And so oh, wow. we we're real proud of her, but she never gave up her dream. You know, mm -hmm. and her dream was to become a doctor. That's what she wanted to do yeah. from, from ever since she was a young kid. And so, and she's still driven that way today. She's not only a good mom, but she's also a good doctor and she pays attention and she's very dedicated to her field. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be the same way because it makes you a better person, makes you a better mother, makes you, you know, a better grandmother. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, eventually uh, now we have grandkids of our own and uh, that's just a new chapter of our life, but it's fun. It's a lot of fun and watch them grow up and, and see what they can do. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Pretty cool. Great. Another question, Rachel? I think you have Yeah, another. sure. I have one more. You being so, yeah. I know you mentioned before being able to go from different career paths and being successful in all of them. I kind of was wondering what advice would you give to other people who want to be successful like you? Um, I think, um, you know, follow your dream. I, I think no matter what you want to do in life, uh, my dad once told me, he said, you know, whatever you do, I don't care what you want to do, but just be the best of what you do because you'll always be in demand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he had an eighth grade education, but he was always a good dad. Um, and he worked for the Ford Motor Company, he was the president of the local union. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that was his way of telling me that being a good father and, and leave his legacy with me is just to keep striving and be better, be the best you can. Uh, and you're not always going to be perfect. You know, there's no perfect science. Nobody's perfect. So you're going to make mistakes, but you have to continue to improve. I, I learned that through the NFL. I learned that in business today as well. And in being a father too, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But, you know, if you just look at the mistake and glare on the mistake and don't try to correct it, then it's just going to be worse. And so I, I think you need to reflect back and, and uh, but continue to strive for that. And I think that's, uh, th that's what I think my advice would be for, for other people. It doesn't matter what you want to do. If you want to shoot for the moon, if you fail, you'll still be amongst the stars. So, you know, go, go for it. And, you know, don't, I mean, in this country, we're lucky today to be, have that opportunity from, you know, people who fought for us, for our freedom in, in wars and my dad and others. I mean, um, I, I think that's uh, something that we need to stand up for because America is the greatest country in the world. And that's why a lot of people want to be here because they can do whatever they want to do. I mean, you're not restricted uh, and, you know, the sky is the limit. So depends on how hard you want to work. And I always believed in hard work and having a great work ethic is the, is the vital thing that's going to make a player a great player or not a great player is the ability to work hard. You look at guys like Jerry Rice who played in the NFL, who are Hall of Famers. The guy was, had an endless work at, at ethic. He would work and work and work at his skill and, and perfect it and keep getting better and never thought he was the best, but he always wanted to be even better. And so uh, that's, that's what I would maybe encourage people to do, respect one another and just work hard. And uh, there's going to be ups and downs. And when you fall, just pick yourself up, dust, dust yourself off and, and, uh, and just keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. That's good advice for optometry students because yeah. you have to stay focused and, you know, yeah. stay strong. It's a, it's a challenging four years, Rachel. <laughs> I know. I felt like I needed that pep talk right now. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had that because I thought about quitting in middle school a few times. But, you know, it's good to have that advice. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think it, a lot of times, too, Alex, it comes from your heart. You know, if it's something that you really want to do, you know, exactly. just let your heart be the – the lead, you know, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there's going to be someone to help you and be there with you. Exactly. And so, you know, it's just, you just got to keep And Like I say, you're not going to pass every exam or, or get high scores on every exam, but you know what, <laughs> if you continue to work hard at it, you will, you will do better and better. Yeah. Right. That's perfect advice for her right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are you speaking just to me? <laughs> no, no, we're speaking to everybody, Rachel. <laughs> All our classmates too. It'll be good. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Dr. JD, anything else you want to add? If you have Question. to uh, real quick, just add, um, did you have a favorite moment from your playing career? 
Yeah, J.D., I think the favorite moment, well, that's a good one. That's a really good question. It's the Super Bowl. It's got to be the Super Bowl, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, well, you know, getting to the Super Bowl, it was like, you know, you, you got to the, you're at the best, the highest you can go. But getting there was the challenge. And I think beating Dallas in Dallas, when they had, you know, Tom Landry, the great, the great coach, uh, he was a, uh, just a, a great strategizer. He could strategize and, and just win games just like Bill Belichick would today. Then they had the great quarterback and Roger Staubach, the great doomsday defense. I mean, they, they were awesome. The Pittsburgh Steelers were as good or better. I mean, they just had no weakness. And so to beat teams like, like Dallas and then Tampa Bay would had a great defense and a great quarterback, it just, you know, it just made it worthwhile because – in the end, you know, some of those guys are my best friends. I mean, Doug Williams is one of my better friends uh, that I've known over the years. And what a great guy he was. And you, you can tell a great athlete, not because of his abilities on the field, but what type of person he really is off the field. Right. Uh, you look like a Russell Wilson right now. Russell Wilson, they say, is the best quarterback in the NFL. Um, you know, I, I mean, he's, he's right there at the top because of his – aspirations because of what he means because of the way he handles himself you know with people um there's so many so many great players but i i always think that uh, there's more to sports there's more to life it's it's you know what you're going to do for somebody else how you're going to perceive them how, how what kind of respect you're going to show and and those kind of things so but the the dallas game was by far and then this playing in the Super Bowl was to me I mean what a what a great thrill to be there and go toe to toe to Pittsburgh Pittsburgh probably the best team ever played in the NFL there's there's been great teams don't get me wrong I mean the Green Bay Packers I mean the Dallas Cowboys were great teams the Pittsburgh Steelers of many years but that that era in this late 70s they had no they had no weakness there was no weakness they had all they had 13 Hall of Famers on that team I played with two Hall of Famers. I played with Jackie Slater and Jack Youngblood, two great players. And then later played, of course, Eric Dickerson. But in that year when we went to Super Bowl, we had two. They had 13. And then the coach was a Hall of Famer too. So that just shows you how good they were. They could, they could beat you anyway. But, uh, and they found a way to beat us too when we were beating them in the fourth quarter. So, but, yeah, great thrills. But I look back on my career as, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was some great thrills. I met some great people. I have some great friends as a result. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, do you want to wrap it up, Dr. Corbin? Oh, no, I'm good. I just want to thank Vince, you know, for doing this for thank us. You know, and doing, so much, doing so much for me and the community over all these years. And, you know, we look forward to more. What's, you know, all this quarantine stuff's over. We'll do more school visits and other cool activities together, Vince. Sounds good. <laughs> I look forward to it, Alex. Love it. It's awesome. And nice uh, being you, Dr. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Doctor. Nice to meet you, Rachel and Alex. Nice. Let's do it again. <laughs>